plant-based Asia Summit, where we inspire a healthier and more sustainable Asia Pacific. My name is Luke, your co-host, and today I'm extremely excited to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Renee Thomas. Dr. Thomas is an Australian-born family and preventative medicine resident currently working in Blue Zone, Loma Linda, California. She has completed a master's in public health, specializing in population medicine, and is currently completing her lifestyle medicine specialist certification. Welcome, Dr. Thomas. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Luke. It's an absolute pleasure, as always, to be here. Indeed. And I'm really excited. I understand that you have a special presentation prepared for the audience today. We sure have. Today, we're going to be talking about eating to live longer. So they say that money can't buy time, but can you eat your way to living longer? My name is Dr. Renee Thomas, and I am super excited to be here with you today to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is nutrition. I currently work in the only United States Blue Zone, Loma Linda in California, and I have spent the past few years learning how some of the healthiest and longest living people in the world eat on a daily basis. So let's get into it, eating to live longer. So what is a blue zone that we're talking about? So the best research describing these, at least to the best of my knowledge, is that of Dan Buettner. He describes the blue zones as communities across the globe where common elements of lifestyle, diet, and personal outlook have led to an amazing quantity, but more importantly, quality of life. His book focuses on four regions of Sardinia, Okinawa, Costa Rica, and of course, Loma Linda. There are eight main takeaways or common features of these areas, and they are eating a predominantly plant-based diet, having strong family values, walking or being active every day, getting outside and enjoying the sunshine, having a positive attitude, definitely valuing your friends and family, having a life purpose, and the last one, drinking plenty of water. So the image here in the top right shows some of the intersections of the blue zones. Here being, for example, not smoking, again, following a plant-based diet, eating legumes, regular moderate physical activity, social engagement, high soy consumption, avoiding alcohol, having a faith, eating whole grains, and of course, again, enjoying the outdoors. So the Blue Zone research has also come together to create recommendations on how to live like a Blue Zoner. And these are often also described as the Power Nine. So many of these are similar to the last eight that I just talked about, the common intersections, such as movement, plant-based diets, family first, that sense of belonging with the right tribe, and having purpose. Some differences that I do tend to point out, though, do include the wine at five, which honestly, I personally believe is more due to the relaxation effects, as unfortunately, the World Health Organization and most leading cancer research foundations actually do say that no amount of alcohol is safe to drink, let alone daily drinking being health promoting. My main experience also comes from the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, where the majority of this population actually does abstain from alcohol, including all of our work functions. Yes, we have carbonated grape juice. True story. So the 80% rule is the other one, and I believe that one comes from Okinawa and Japan and is based on the term hachi hachi bu or stopping eating when 80% full. Now, I didn't spend a ton of time on my travels in Okinawa, but I have visited many parts of Japan. And honestly, I have never had so many people try to feed me as much as I had there. I could have said I was 120% full and there was always an extra bowl of rice offered to me. I do respect the principle and the mindful eating that comes uh, associated with that. However, my concern is that may come across as the all too common message of portion control, which honestly tends to be far less effective than say following the principles of caloric density, which is my preferred and recommended advice for achieving and sustaining a healthy body weight, which allows eating until satiety without having that hunger associated with most diets using plant-based foods. 
but more on that later. So let's talk Loma Linda. So Loma Linda actually has one of the highest life expectancies in the entire world. Residents here are 10 times more likely to live to, their, to, live to see their 100th birthday than the typical American. The average male in Loma Linda lives to the age of 89 and the average woman lives to be 91. Both of these are 10 years longer than the national average. And not only the important part is they're not just living longer. I mean, I work in a hospital. We could do a lot of things to make you live longer, but these people are living in good health well into their latter years. I, you know, I've seen people in my office that are 90 and the only time they've been hospitalized is to give birth and maybe they take a multivitamin as their medications. It's incredible. Um, and also uh, this has been on popular news sometimes, but there has even been surgeons still operating into their late 80s and 90s at the Loma Linda University Hospital. This is quantity and quality of life. Of additional interest, and one of the main reasons I wanted to work here, Loma Linda has the Adventist Health Studies, which have really provided this great insight into the effects of diet on health and longevity. Now, these health improvements mentioned apply to Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda as a whole, but actually within this health conscious population, there are even subgroups that experience even greater health benefits. And this is because while the majority of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda do not smoke cigarettes, they do not drink alcohol and do not consume caffeine and actually have very low meat intakes compared to the average American, about 50% of this group, again, actually doesn't eat any meat at all, following a vegetarian or vegan nutritional pattern. This really set up for a perfect study group, as many of these are normally confounding or influencing factors in other dietary studies, which are largely controlled for in this group of Seventh-day Adventists. There are two main studies following this, the Adventist Health Study 1, which has about 34,000 participants and ran from 1974 to 1988. And then the Adventist Health Study 2, which has about 96,000 participants, started in 2002 and is actually remaining ongoing. The key researchers are Fraser, Butler and Orlich, and they definitely deserve respect for their findings. So just to highlight, some of the key findings include that Adventist males live over seven years longer than the average American and nine years longer if they are vegetarian. Similarly, females are living four years longer and then up to six years additionally longer if they follow a vegetarian diet. Those that are non-vegetarian, even in this health conscious population, have twice the risk for heart disease compared to those who are vegetarian. Eating nuts regularly actually was found to halve the risk of cardiovascular disease and heart disease. Numerous cancers have also been studied in the Adventist health research, and in particular, the risks of colon cancer, bladder and ovarian cancer were actually increased in the non-vegetarian group compared to the vegetarian group. And finally, even in those that were lifelong non-smokers, there was 70% less lung cancer in those who ate the most fruits and vegetables. The good news is you do not necessarily have to go 100% plant-based overnight. Health had been shown in these studies to improve on a spectrum, as seen in many of these diagrams. The more that one moves towards eating more plants, the greater health benefits they had achieved. We can see stepwise progression in disease risk reduction or risk of getting the disease as one moves towards a plant-based or vegan lifestyle. It is important to clarify here, though, that non-vegetarians in the Adventist health studies only had to eat meat once a week or less, to, sorry, once a week or more to be classified as non-vegetarian. So it's actually much less than you would think. Many people say, I don't eat a lot of meat, but could you say you only ate it one time per week? And that's how they were classified as non-vegetarian. For example here, the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus is reduced by at least 60% by following a total vegetarian or vegan nutritional pattern. Hypertension, or the medical term for high blood pressure, the risk is reduced by 75% from the non-vegetarian to the total vegetarian or vegan groups. 
cholesterol, one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease, is significantly lowered with the reduction in consuming animal products again. And as such follows the reduction in the risk for heart disease seen here in the purple by over 85%. Vegan Adventists were the only group in the study to have a normal or healthy range BMI or body mass index, which is your weight for height, with the average vegetarian woman weighing almost 40 pounds less than a non-vegetarian Adventist woman. Again, the non-Adventist, sorry, non-vegetarian Adventist woman who is considered health conscious at baseline, much healthier than the average American. I do just want to emphasize here, though, that there is improvement in every group that ate less animal products than the non-vegetarians. So every meat-free meal is doing you well, even if you aren't ready or don't want to go 100%. However, from a medical perspective, for a disease reversal rather than just this risk reduction we're talking about, it is probably best to consider going 100%, at least until you achieve some significant health benefits or health improvements. So to summarize, can you say buy eight extra years of life by the way you eat? Now, these may not actually be cumulative as I've taken them from different studies, but people following each of these health habits were found to live an extra two years for each of the following. Number one, following a vegetarian dietary pattern. Number two, eating nuts regularly defined as five servings per week another two years for never smoking, and finally two years extra for engaging in physical activity regularly. So I've been talking a lot about plant-based or vegan diet and should probably define what I'm talking about because there are actually numerous variations of vegan diets or vegan nutritional patterns ranging from Coca-Cola and Oreos, yes, both are vegan in most countries, to what we call whole food plant-based or WFPB, which really does have the most research behind it for improving health and preventing disease. And so it's the one that I tend to focus on as a medical professional. And honestly, it's also pretty simple. Focus lies here on consuming mostly intact whole grains. So brown rice, quinoa, millet, oats, and buckwheat, for example. Legumes, which include peas, beans, split peas, chickpeas, soy products, and lentils. Fruits and vegetables, of course, and any of all of those are included. And then herbs and spices, both fresh and dried, and nuts and seeds. I think that sounds pretty good, right? So. Why else would you want to eat this way? So let's start off with what we call all-cause mortality. And all-cause mortality is basically the medical term from dying from any cause. So when we're talking about living longer, all-cause mortality risk is something we want to reduce because if you have a high risk of dying, you definitely don't have a high risk of living longer, high chance, sorry, of living longer. Now, in those eating plant-based, their risk for this all-cause mortality is actually about 15 to 28% lower, correlating with living longer. So one of the biggest benefits of eating plant-based, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot, but it's the increase in dietary fiber. So why is this? And it is because only plant-based foods contain fiber. That's right, there is absolutely none in foods that are animal-derived. Every extra 10 grams in fiber is associated with a decrease in all-cause mortality up to at least 30 grams of fiber per day. Now, 30 might sound like a lot, but really it's about two and a half cups of vegetables, a big serving of fruit, a cup of whole grains, half a cup of beans, and a quarter of a cup of nuts and seeds per day, which is honestly pretty achievable when you think about it over the course of a day. Switching to eating plant-based also reduces all-cause mortality, uh, the risk by reducing animal product-derived saturated fats. Now, plant foods in general tend to be low in saturated fats as well, but by replacing 5% of animal-derived saturated fats with unsaturated fats from plant foods, all-cause mortality risk decreases by 27%, so nearly 30% less chance of dying from any cause. Now, let's go into some of the specific diseases and let's start with cancer. So cancer risk as a whole, that is all cancers combined, is about 18% lower in vegetarians compared to those eating an omnivorous diet or a diet that can, uh, includes animal products. 
cancer rates can be up to 80% lower for certain cancer types for those following plant-based diets. For every 30 grams of processed meat consumed per day, the risk for colorectal cancer increases by almost 10%. Now, people say, but is that just processed meat? Actually, no. Every 120 grams of unprocessed red meat consumed increases the risk for cancer in general by about 28%. And just 50 grams of processed meat, as pictured here, so you can see two slices of smoked ham or half a hot dog, for example, is associated with an 18% increased risk in all cancer types. And uh, in the right, normal levels of dairy consumption, so two to three servings per day, are associated with a 10% increased risk in prostate cancer. So what about heart disease? Uh, the number one killer of Americans and most of the Western world combined, uh, we talk about cardiovascular disease risk, which includes both heart disease and strokes. And it is about 40% lower in those who follow a plant-based diet. And in a study of people with previous heart disease or pre-existing heart disease, those that chose to follow a strict low-fat plant-based diet had only 0.6%, so less than 1% recurrence in cardiovascular disease events, such as a heart attack or a stroke, versus 62% uh, recurrence in those who chose not to stick to the diet in the intervention study. The diet alone was able to decrease stenosis or blockages in the coronary arteries, the arteries of the heart, that would often in typical medical care require stent placement. And of course, back to fiber again, but just adding seven grams of fiber, so just one cup of broccoli per day can actually reduce your risk of stroke by about 7%. Now, having hypertension or what's typically known as high blood pressure puts you at risk for heart disease, strokes, as well as kidney disease. Uh, vegans or those following plant-based diets have been found to have less than half the prevalence of high blood pressure or hypertension. And an easy intervention, adding just 10 grams of flax seeds per day, that's half a tablespoon, can reduce cholesterol levels, another risk factor for heart disease and stroke, by 14% in just one month. And it improves the HDL to LDL or the so-called good to bad cholesterol ratio. For every 28 grams served or just one ounce of whole grains eaten per day, one can reduce their cardiovascular mortality or risk of dying from cardiovascular disease by 9%. So what about diabetes? One of the other big chronic disease problems in most of the Western world. Uh, as we were talking about earlier in the Adventist health studies, diabetes risk reduces with plant-based nutritional patterns as well. One thing I typically try and point out is one of the pretty strong studies found that three to five eggs per week actually can double one's risk of developing type two diabetes. On the flip side, no pun intended, including again our flax seeds, this time just 10 grams of flax seeds can reduce the A1C, which is the three month marker of blood sugar control used in many countries such as the United States to both diagnose diabetes and follow up on control of diabetes. Now this little 10 grams of flax seeds can reduce the A1C by 15% in just one month. For comparison, metformin, the number one medication typically prescribed as first line for type 2 diabetes, reduces the A1C by 1.5% at maximum doses, that is 1,000 milligrams twice per day. And summaries of previous, sorry, a summary of most of the previous studies of what we call oral anti-diabetic drugs, metformin is one of them, meaning pills that help with diabetes, suggests that they reduce A1C levels by about 0.5 to 1.5% and are a lot more expensive than flax seeds. Okay, let's talk about another major chronic disease and that is autoimmune diseases. Now, this is a very broad category with a wide range of severities. And, but however, there are numerous common threads, which is why they are lumped together under the umbrella of autoimmune disease. One of the major markers that is measured for autoimmune disease is what we call C-reactive protein or CRP. And it is a marker of inflammation, which is often elevated on diagnosis and during flares of those with autoimmune disease, and sometimes is persistently elevated in those with autoimmune disease. A three-week uh, vegan lifestyle intervention study found that they were able to reduce the CRP inflammatory markers by 33% in the three weeks. 
This was attributed to the anti-inflammatory components of the diet, the high fiber, and the high fruit and vegetable content that was included. Again, increased dietary fiber, remembering fiber is only found in plant foods, has been correlated with a decrease in CRP by about 25 to 54% in those with autoimmune disease. For specific autoimmune diseases, some examples are that high intakes of meat and animal products are associated with nearly 2.5 times the risk for inflammatory arthritis or different arthritis types. Vegan dietary patterns, on the other hand, have been associated with less than half the risk for thyroid diseases compared to omnivorous diets considered healthy, such as those in our Adventist health studies we were talking about. But the fast food fan, eating fast food at least twice a week has been associated with 3.4 to 3.9 times the risk for inflammatory bowel diseases, including those such as Crohn's and ulcerative colon. Ulcer oh my gosh, one second. Ulcerative colitis. <laughs> High intakes of animal fat increases the risk of these by over four times. High intakes of animal protein and milk protein are also strongly correlated, not only with the increased risk for these inflammatory bowel diseases, but also the risk for relapse, increased hospitalization rates, and the risk for the need for surgery for those with inflammatory bowel diseases, such as a colectomy or part of the bowel being removed. The risk for inflammatory bowel diseases is actually halved for those with high fiber intakes of 15 grams per day, which really is only half the recommendation uh, for intakes of dietary fiber in most countries. Even a semi-vegetarian diet designed for those with Crohn's disease patients has been shown to reduce the risk of relapse by 100% at one year and by 94% at two years. Now, I did mention earlier that in the Adventist health studies, those following the vegan nutritional pattern were the only ones in the study to have a healthy range BMI or body mass index. As I said, basically how much weighs for us, one weighs for their height. Now, I want to emphasize here that I do truly believe that excess body weight is very complex and multifactorial with many factors out of one's control. However, research does suggest that we can optimize and improve whatever cards we have been dealt, at least to some extent, with health promoting nutrition. Rather than focusing on weight loss and diets, because let's be real, they do not work. I try to shift the focus to adding in healthier habits because improving nutrition does have numerous health benefits, even in the absence of weight loss. But sometimes by just trying to eat better, weight loss happens out automatically. Now in saying this, I do understand that many people wanna lose weight as well. And honestly, medically, many will benefit health-wise from losing even just 10% of their excess body weight. And that is often really correlated with health improvements when done in a health promoting way, not a crash diet or restrictive diet. Now, excess body weight and excess body fat in particular, unfortunately can affect almost every organ in the body negatively. And achieving and maintaining a healthy body weight really does help one to live longer. Obesity takes about six to 14 years off someone's life and increases the risk of of all cause mortality by about 20%. Excess body weight and body fat contributes to breathing problems, liver dysfunction, diabetes risk, cardiovascular disease, infertility and irregular menstruation, hormone imbalances, erectile and sexual dysfunction, pregnancy complication risk, many types of cancer, arthritis, mental illness, cognitive decline, kidney disease, infections, chronic pain, and numerous skin conditions. That's a lot, but what can we do about it? So the best evidence that we really do have is to adopt a whole food plant-based nutritional pattern. And I hate the term diet, which is why I try and avoid it. As I said, they don't work. Diet here really just re refers to the foods that we eat per day. But this whole food plant-based nutritional pattern, this has been shown to bring the greatest weight loss actually ever published in a high quality study, which was a randomized control clinical trial that did not include caloric restriction or mandate exercise. 
So that sounds a little too good to be true. How does it actually work? Now, based on human studies by Dr. Rolls, it was found that most people actually eat similar volumes of food that is by weight per day to reach satiety. So satiety being eating until you're comfortably full, but not stuck. Now, by focusing on foods that are defined as less than 600 calories per pound, and that is largely fruits, vegetables, legumes, starchy vegetables like potatoes, and unrefined whole grains, people actually found that they could eat as frequently and as much as they were truly hungry for, and they were able to attain a healthy weight without having to weigh foods, count foods, measure foods, restrict foods, and as you can see here in the picture to the left, when you decrease the caloric uh, density of the foods that one eats, you can actually eat a significantly larger volume of food for the same calories, making it much easier to lose weight and eat less calories without going hungry. I mean, you can just look at them. The quantity on the right is more than double the quantity on the left, and they have the same amount of calories. Now, for more on this, two of my favorite videos are Jeff Novick's How to Eat More, Weigh Less, and Live Longer, and Dr. Lyle's How to Lose Weight Without Losing Your Mind. And both are well worth a watch if you are struggling with your weight and freely available on YouTube. There are also numerous other symptoms, diseases, and illnesses and conditions affecting one's life that have been shown to improve for many people on transitioning to eating more plant-based. These include, but are not limited to things like constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, reflux, asthma, eczema, other autoimmune diseases I didn't talk about, allergies, acne, depression, anxiety, cognitive decline, and many, many more. Okay. So the health benefits might sound good. Hopefully some of these were convincing, but come on, let's say it with me. What is the first thing everyone asks when we talk about plant-based diets? But where will I get my protein? And I joke and I mention this all the time, but the reality really is this is one of the number one questions that gets asked when we're talking about plant-based diets, because it is drilled into people that these comes from foods of animal source. But really the reality is that on average, Calorie for calorie, those eating meat-free diets get higher intakes of nearly every nutrient. And they definitely get far more of the good stuff, the fiber that I keep harping on about, vitamins and minerals. And other than some really strict, say, fruit-based diets or those eating very highly processed food-like substances, we can call them, aka junk food, which are high in refined sugars, high in refined oils, other than these patterns, it's actually really challenging to design a diet that is deficient in protein for the average person that is meeting their caloric needs. What plant-based diets do often have less of, however, and they're things that you won't be getting on a plant-based diet as much, are excess sodium, saturated fats, cholesterol, and excess calories, the things that we want to avoid. But for real, what about protein? You know, let's just start with what you actually need for good health. And this is really overestimated. I cannot say how much this is overestimated. The World Health Organization states that adequate protein is actually about 5% of our caloric intake, which for your standard 2000 calories per day is only 100 calories from protein, one protein shake really, or just 25 grams per day. Now, to put that 5% in context of how little it truly is, Rice, for example, has about 8% protein, corn has 11%, oatmeal has 15%, and beans have a whopping 27% of calories from protein, making the 5% recommendation extremely easy to achieve. Protein recommendations, not just minimums, have typically been increased or roughly doubled by most countries' nutritional recommendations and guidelines to ensure that the vast majority of the population meets the defined uh, or definite safe intakes of protein. The general consensus really is that the average human needs about 0.8 grams per kilogram. Now, for those in the US, uh, that is weight in pounds divided by 2.2, which equates to roughly 56 grams for the standard 70 kilogram male. 
Athletes do have slightly higher requirements on average, up to about 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram or 84 grams for our sample subject of our 70 kilogram male which is generally reflected actually by the increase in total overall caloric requirements for athletes, keeping the percentage of protein actually pretty consistent. And before someone asks, yes, countless studies and nutritional boards have confirmed that any single whole natural plant food or any combination of them eaten as the sole source of calories for a day provides all of the essential amino acids and sufficient protein for optimal health beyond just the minimal requirements, regardless of the percentage or the types of amino acids, the protein quality, the availability or the digestibility of the protein foods. And really, the reason I am including this in this talk is that despite uh, common myths that more is better, high dietary protein, especially dietary protein that is animal derived, is associated with total mortality rates being significantly increased. Now, to put this in context, the protein, one cup of cooked oats cooked in soy milk for breakfast, one cup of cooked lentils with a cup of cooked quinoa for lunch, one large baked potato with two cups of vegetables for dinner, maybe a handful of seeds for a snack, contains over 120 grams of total protein, which is more than enough to meet almost everyone's optimal requirements, athlete or not. So let's go on to the next hot question, which typically comes up when we're talking about plant-based nutrition, and that is, but what about calcium? Surely you can't get calcium without consuming dairy products. Well, the main question here, really, what people are asking is less about calcium and actually more about bone health and bone strength. And really, honestly, dairy consumption has not been strongly associated with stronger bones, despite the high levels of calcium that it does contain. Many countries with the highest dairy intakes actually also have some of the highest rates of osteoporosis or weaker bones or bone degradation as we get older, and also increased fracture risks, suggesting that such high dairy consumption is actually not sufficient alone to promote bone health. Calcium is also actually associated, uh, sorry, Calcium is actually also better absorbed from plants compared to milk and milk products. It's actually about 50% absorbed compared to the 32% absorption rates on average from dairy products. This actually makes one cup of chopped kale the equivalent to one cup of milk for the absorbable calcium levels. The recommended daily intake or RDI or dietary intake for calcium in the United States is 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams per day. However, it's important to note the World Health Organization actually only recommends about 400 to 500 milligrams and noting that calcium needs increase with the increased intakes of animal protein and sodium in the diet, both of which are very rich in a Western or United States typical diet, hence the higher requirements for calcium. The RDI for calcium in the US is roughly based from dairy foods, and that is on the average absorption of calcium of about 25%. So like I said, that of dairy products, which as we said, is actually half of the absorption from plants, as mentioned with the kale example, meaning that adults should be aiming for uh, an absorbable calcium or to absorb 250 to 350 milligrams of calcium per day. Plant-based or vegan eaters who consume at least this 500 milligrams of calcium per day have no increased risk in fractures compared to those consuming dairy products. And actually, Asian populations have been estimated to require even less for fracture risk reduction at around 400 milligrams per day. For context, to meet even the highest recommendation as recommended by the United States, one could eat two oranges sprinkled with two tablespoons of chia seeds, a kale and bean salad with tahini dressing, a handful of almonds for a snack and an Asian green stir fry to get 1200 to 1300 milligrams of calcium just in one day. And thirdly, the next big question, what about iron? Surely we have to eat red meat for iron, right? Well, of course, actually no. While iron deficiency and anemia can be a real issue, there is no evidence that plant-based diets increase the risk for iron deficiency or anemia or that vegetarians or vegans have greater rates of anemia or iron store depletion. In fact, most people, even those that eat meat or consume omnivorous diets, actually still obtain the majority of their dietary iron from non-heme or plant-derived sources of iron. 
So how much do we actually need and can we get this from plants alone? So men and postmenopausal women require about eight milligrams of iron per day. Menstruating women require about 18 milligrams per day and uh, that's due to the blood loss. And pregnant women have the highest requirements at 27 milligrams of iron per day. For context, there are many plant-based sources that exceed the iron levels of food typically thought of as high in iron. For example, just one cup of lentils has double the iron of three ounces of lean beef and half a cup of chia seeds has five times as much iron as the same quantity of lean beef. Crazy, right? So a day of eating, let's go with one cup of oatmeal, half a cup of raisin and nut trail mix. Uh, one baked potato with one cup of beans and some cooked leafy greens on the side. And a lentil and kale soup for dinner would provide over 30 milligrams of iron in one day, which is more than needed by the average pregnant woman. And like we said, they have the highest requirements of all of us. Pretty simple to get that iron from plant-based sources. Okay, so hopefully I haven't bored you and maybe even piqued your interest a little that maybe you want to know more. So I thought I would include here some of my favorite resources to find out more. I am probably missing hundreds because I read way too much, but this should at least keep you going for a while. For documentaries, we really have the original Forks Over Knives and then my two favorites, What the Health and The Game Changers. Game Changers is particularly interesting for athletes. For YouTube, we have Dr. Milton Mills for dispelling pretty much all the myths that anyone could ask you that we are designed to eat meat. And Dr. Greger's nutritionfacts.org for great overview short videos for almost anything you can think of related to plant-based nutrition. For books, we have my friends at Mastering Diabetes, great for anyone with diabetes, pre-diabetes, even type one diabetes, gestational diabetes. Dr. Greger's How Not to Die, Dr. Brooke Goldner's Goodbye Autoimmune Disease book, Dr. Dean Ornish's Undo It, Dr. Esselstein's Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, which is where the heart disease study I talked about came from, and Dr. McDougall's Starch Solution. He also has a great website, as does Dr. Gregor. I also really love the PCRM or the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine's website and their power plate pictured here in the bottom right. Super, super simple ways to get healthy. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine also has a great number of member resources and handouts, many of which I use in my clinical practice. So I hope this helps. And finally, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Luke and to the summit for having me and for what I think is maybe my fifth year in a row. And I am so grateful for everyone listening. I still pinch myself that anyone wants to listen to little old me. And I am super open to questions and helping in any way I can. So let us know. And thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. I love what you shared. My goodness, you, you covered so much. And it was literally a plant-based lifestyle one-on-one. -on -one. And what I picked up on is you, you don't like to use the word diet, neither do I. It's really a, a lifestyle and it's a long-term kind of solution to, to really everything from health to fitness to disease reversal as well. So I know you have worked with many, many patients in your time in residency. So maybe you could just kind of uh, share a little bit of some challenges that you know people face because for example, based in Singapore from hawker food to beans, you know, it's such a huge jump. So maybe you can share some challenges that um, some of your patients face and what have you done to help them achieve uh, certain micro goals that, that you've set for them? Yeah, of course. Um, you bring up some wonderful points. And of course, transitioning or changes in anything are not easy. People don't like change on average. Um, and changes can be really, really challenging. Um, I guess to start off with that, challenges that I see really is what you talk about is just unfamiliarity, you know, lack of education in that particular area. You know, some of the smartest people have never even heard about a plant-based diet. Um, families, finance, access, so many things that can come in the way. And I really like to use motivational interviewing and not in a cheesy way, but really figuring out at the core of that person, what is motivating them. And for example, you know, I may have someone with diabetes and for me as their doctor, my goal is to improve their diabetes, but really 
they might not really care about diabetes per se. And their motivation might be that they want to be able to chase their kids at the park, right? And so it's meeting them where they're at and focusing the changes, reminding yourself of what that change will bring to your life that's motivating for you to change. A lot of people aren't, you know, it's it's easy on the day-to-day to look at your diabetes numbers, for example, and be like, oh, whatever. But every day that you can't chase your kids, remind yourself where you're going with the changes that you're making and really cling on to that. I have people put pictures up on the refrigerator, you know, a reminder note in their wallet, an elastic band on their wrist that says, you know, uh, hope or strength or something to remind themselves of what they're really doing. The second part, um, you know, once you have your motivation is the education piece is really understanding because there's so much information and misinformation out there and it is overwhelming and you're going to have people telling you all kinds of things. And so I think finding information that you trust that feels right to you, that feels doable for you and sustainable for you and really holding to that and figuring out what that looks like for you. Um, The other part of education is learning how that works for you. And one of the examples I use all the time is uh, transitioning from dairy milk, which most people learn, start drinking, uh, or, you know, dairy products, yogurts, ice creams, whatever that looks like, cheeses. And finding, I use the milk as an example because it's a good example that you need to find what works for you. Now, we live in a lucky world now, unlike when I was a child growing up plant-based, where my only option was kind of weird tasting soy milk that was in the Asian grocery store. Now we have almond milk, we have oat milk, we have good tasting soy milk, we have, I don't know, pistachio milk, we have everything these days, right? And you you just find the one that works for you. I personally, you know, I don't like a lot of them, but I love a good quality soy milk. And so that's, that's my version, right? If I had to drink um, almond milk, I wouldn't be as much of a fan. So it's finding the ones that work for you. And that leads into another strategy, instead of just going 100% overnight, which is so overwhelming. One of the things I like to say, I have a couple of tricks. One is uh, substitution. So milk is the one I often suggest. Hey, in your morning uh, coffee or whatever you're drinking or on your cereal, could you try a plant-based milk? And try them out, see which one you like. And a lot of people can make that switch pretty easily. The second one would be adding something in. So instead of thinking, oh gosh, I don't know what a plant-based dinner is. Make your normal dinner, but add in an extra cup of vegetables and add in a cup of beans and see how it goes. And you're kind of diluting out the animal products. Um, The example I typically use for that one might be like a spaghetti bolognese. Into your meat base, add in some beans, add in some vegetables, and you've really diluted out a lot of the meat there. And you'll start to become acquired to the taste of the plant-based foods while it's still tasting familiar. The recipe is familiar. It's not super overwhelming. That's kind of the starting place I start for with making changes. The other one I wanted to mention because it is huge and it comes up all the time because a lot of people's perception of plant-based eating is, I don't want to say the brand name, but we all have those fancy uh, plant-based markets or stores and they have all these uh, mock meats and super expensive options. You know, you're looking at smoothies for $20 and it just seems so unaffordable and unattainable when you can go to the dollar menu at a lot of these fast food places. So this is uh, one of the things that I was super motivated and this is freely available on my website is I collaborated to come up with cheap plant-based eating that has been, you know, I've used it in my patients to get great results in um, improving their health. And it is based upon uh, five, three to five dollars per day menu, um, requiring all your daily uh, nutrients, your vitamins, your minerals, and the recipes are really simple. And all of them are available in common grocery stores. I went to Um, I talk a lot about Loma Linda in the blue zone, but actually across the train tracks right near me and where my primary care clinic is actually San Bernardino, which is a drastically different population, uh, very underserved, a lot of people unfortunately struggling financially. And I went into those supermarkets to see what does food cost, what is available in these stores and designed meal plans based upon that, that would also be, this is only California, I know this talk is going elsewhere, but also something that would be covered by WIC or CalFresh or some kind of food stamps because they were common available foods like rice and beans and putting that into what a day looks like so that you can improve your health with no guesswork.
was there any other parts of your question that I missed there? Like that was a lot. I was trying to remember all of it. Uh, no, I, I think you covered covered every aspect. And what I what I got from you was definitely, I mean, the key is with any change is to find out why it's important to you because the motivation drives action, new habits, new patterns as well. So and and I think the low-hanging fruit, which I got from you as well, is eliminate dairy and change dairy. And fortunately in Asia, we've we're surrounded by soy milk. So just you know, uh, just have soy milk instead of dairy milk. Unfortunately, dairy is is ubiquitous in Asia. So, go back to go back to soy, and add versus focus on adding versus sub- subtracting. And really, we can actually have a pretty cost effective meal that is that helps with health and longevity. So that's what I got, and I think that covers covers everything and on top of that of beyond that it's just the, the talk uh, and all that you've shared in your presentation i definitely learned a lot so thank you so much renee fifth year in a row i really appreciate your work and and really your friendship as well and all that you've shared today and you know all all, all the times that we've met together Thank you so much. It's always an absolute pleasure. I love being here. I love your audience. Love everyone, yourself included. Thank you so, so very much. I'm so happy to be here.